This is Functional Medicine Update for December 2009, Volume 29, Number 12. This special two-part edition of FMU will be a historical overview of orthomolecular and functional medicine. Part 1 will include the birth of orthomolecular medicine at the beginning of the last century, and the bulk of Part 1 of this issue will be an interview of Dr. Linus Pauling, recorded with Jeffrey Bland in 1982. Part two of this edition will feature a recent interview with Dr. Bland with Dr. Abram Hoffer shortly before his passing. Following this interview, Dr. Bland will be discussing the contributions of today's medicine by Drs. Pauling, Hoffer, and other contributing pioneers, including Dr. Roger Williams. Dr. Bland's comments will include how vitamin C functions as a therapeutic agent, why nutrition is for real people, and what the future holds for this new age of medicine. Now here is Dr. Jeffrey Bland and the December 2009 edition of Functional Medicine Update. I'd have to say this is an issue to remember for all of us. Never in the history of functional medicine, and it's now nearly 28 years, have we had on the same issue two of the founding fathers of the whole concept of molecular medicine and functional medicine. You're going to be privileged to hear from the voices of two of the founding fathers, both unfortunately now deceased, who have made the extraordinary intellectual contributions to the birthing of our field. Dr. Linus Pauling, two-time Nobel Prize winning laureate, back still even today, the only person to have won two independent Nobel Prizes in two different fields, one in chemistry and the other in peace. And secondly, Dr. Abram Hoffer, MD, PhD, father of orthomolecular psychiatry, and obviously one of the extraordinary contributors to the whole paradigm of functional nutrition and its relationship to neurological activity. With that as an introduction, let me, if I can, presage the comments that you're going to hear from Dr. Pauling in an interview that I had the privilege of doing with him back in the early 1980s when I was a research associate at the Linus Pauling Institute of Science and Medicine on sabbatical from my teaching position at the university. This is a historical interview, and I think you'll find it quite interesting to get Dr. Pauling's take in the early 1980s on what the status of affairs was as it pertained to vitamin C and orthomolecular medicine then and his forecast of what it would be in the future. We'll uh, wait for his own comments to see how good a forecaster he was, but I think you'll find it an extraordinarily prescient discussion. To set the tone, however, before we get into Dr. Pauling's interview, I thought we might go back and just review quickly the history that led up to this extraordinary 1982 interview and later my extraordinary privilege of interviewing Dr. Abram Hoffer in 2008. The theme really derives out of the intellectual soil from the end of the 19th century. If you recall the end of the 19th century in terms of the history of science and medicine, this was a period of time that you had people like Rudolf Virchow, the father of modern pathology, who started moving into understanding the origin of disease as a pathological-based condition and codifying in a systematic way tissue pathology and defining disease as entities related to these pathologies. This was tied together with the development of the concept of human genetics, now resurrecting the discoveries that were made by Gregor Mendel that lay dormant for a 100 years when the church really wasn't too excited about the Mendelian genetics getting well understood. And it was rediscovered by Gregory Bateson in the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, as a major theme in the connection with inherited traits and how they interrelated with Charles Darwin at this same period, this epic period of time, the understanding of the nature of evolution and natural selection, all of this tying together to give rise to the birthing of what we consider the modern concept of the origin of disease that was seen in the 20th century. Also, this was the time of origin, really, of systematic organic chemistry with Emil Fischer, the extraordinary German chemist that was starting to help us understand 
that there wasn't some vitalism in natural molecules, that they were interrelated with molecules that could be seen in the test tube. And the work, as you know, of Wohler on the conversion of cyanate into urea and ultimately the recognition that the inorganic and organic world were connected through chemistry. And this whole concept that vitalism was being put aside and the concept of reductionistic understanding of the milieu of life was starting to emerge. And then as we go from there, we actually recognize that the origin of the age of vitamins started to emerge right at the turn of the century with the discovery of the anti-beriberi factor as the Eichmann work on thymine as an agent that could prevent and treat beriberi, the vitamine, the substances that were derived vital amines from food. And, of course, we tie that together with Ely Mechnikov working at the Pasteur Institute who won a Nobel Prize in medicine for his discoveries about the origin of the immune system and later his prolongation of life concept as it relates to the colon as the origin of many diseases through the alteration of the immune system. All of this was happening at the latter portion of the 19th century. It was an epic period for setting new paradigms in place just as the start of the 21st century has been a similar epic period as we start to look at systems biology and molecular medicine and start to look at the influence of various agents in the environment on genomic expression and the birthing of nutrigenomics, nutriproteomics, nutrimetabolomics, and what we call the trilogy of omics. It's establishing a new way of looking at the origin of dysfunction, metabolic disturbance, and ultimately chronic disease. So this period of change that occurred at the end of the 19th century, moving into the 20th century, also was a period of time where an extraordinary person by the name of Dr. Archibald Garad, a third-generation medical doctor whose father was really the person who was given credit in discovering the first autoimmune disease, which is gout. His father crystallized on a thread put in a gout patient's urine the first crystals of uric acid, which thanks to the birthing of organic chemistry could be analyzed to be seen as uric acid and from that was born the molecular connection to the first autoimmune disease. This would be during the middle of the 19th century. Dr. Garad, the son, Archibald, then took these concepts and actually wrote the first textbook on autoimmune disease that was sent in the English literature back in the late 1800s and early 1900s. So Dr. Archibald Garad then took this concept on even farther, looking at colored compounds in urine. This is the age of the starting of spectroscopy and the understanding of chromophores and how light abstracting compounds that gave rise to color could be used to identify chemical constituents. And colored urine was a very interesting part of the application of this concept of spectroscopy in the late 19th and 20th century. So Dr. Garad was able to start looking at some of these porphyrias and looking at things that were related to colored compounds in urine and identified then the first genetic metabolism diseases of infancy, that being alcaptonuria. And in fact, interestingly enough, his article that was published originally in The Lancet in 1902 entitled The Incidence of Alcaptonuria, Study in Chemical Individuality, really was the birthing of the whole field of molecular uniqueness, biochemical individuality, and later what we called molecular medicine, which was a term coined by Dr. Linus Pauling. And I think if you go back and read the article by Dr. Garad in The Lancet in 1902, you would find that many of the things that it describes are as modern today as they were at the turn of the last century. I find it absolutely fascinating that when he looks at the concept of a genetic metabolism disease through the lens of that period of time and his own connection between the chemical world and physiological and medical world, from that emerges a platform for understanding the origin of many diseases that were previously not understood at all. This is what Thomas Kuhn called a paradigm shift, a major shift in thinking. I quote from a part of Dr. Garad's landmark paper, and he says, quote, There are good reasons for thinking that alcaptonuria is not the manifestation of a disease, but is rather of the nature of an alternative course of metabolism, harmless and usually congenital and lifelong. Witness is born to its harmlessness by those who have manifest this peculiarity without any apparent detriment to health from infancy into adult, even into advanced age. However, we can see that those individuals who excrete 
excess levels of homogentistic acid, these individuals have a unique aspect of metabolism that is controlled by aspects of their family history, end quote. So from that, I would suggest that he is starting to talk very beautifully about the nature of biochemical individuality and how it can express itself into the phenotype over the course of living. Some things are seen in infancy. Other things are seen later in life as it relates to these genetic uniquenesses. And what we might consider to be a genetic defect might actually be defined as a genetic uniqueness requiring a specific environment in order to minimize the potential adverse effects of that uniqueness or to optimize the positive nature of that genetic uniqueness. I want you to recall when this was written in 1902, this is the age of really the development of molecular genetics and ultimately genetics in medicine. So this was fairly early on in Bateson's argument that we need to look at genes and genetic lineages and look at these dominant recessive characteristics that were originally described in peas through the work of the great monk working in his garden, Gregor Mendel. So from that extraordinary soil, to use the gardening metaphor, of Dr. Garad was born then the germination of this concept of molecular uniqueness and biochemical individuality. As we roll the clock, the hourglass forward, we're led then into the middle 1900s. Now I'm in the 20th century, 1949 with an extraordinary back-to-back series of two papers that appeared in Science Magazine. The first is by a gentleman by the name of James Neal, N-E-E-L, who was the chairman, director of the Heredity Clinic, a laboratory of vertebrate and biology at the University of Michigan. And this is a paper that appeared in the July 15, 1949 issue of Science Magazine, volume 110, page 64, in which he's talking about the inheritance of a genetic metabolism-related disorder, and that is sickle cell anemia. And so I want you to recall the timeline. We're 50 years downstream now from where Dr. Garad was talking about the porphyrias and talking about alkaptonuria and other genetic metabolism disorders that could be seen clinically as altered color of urine with these colored compounds being excreted in the urine as a consequence of different metabolism. And some of these urine compounds, by the way, didn't develop as colored compounds until the urine was exposed to light because they undergo photochemical reactions with these metabolites to produce conjugated compounds that are colored. So this is a whole interesting chapter of evolution of the chemistry connection to medicine and to genetics. So in 1949, James Neal talks about what happens in a drop of blood from a member of the family who has sickle cell anemia, talking about that you get this bizarre clumping of the cells in the sickle or holly leaf shape and the ability of these erythrocytes to sickle is a phenomenon that appears to be attended by no pathological consequences in the majority of these individuals until, and I want to emphasize, they're thrust into some kind of an unusual environment. This could be stress, sleep deprivation, dehydration, physical trauma, infection. And then at that point of stress, this characteristic, this genetic tendency for these blood cells to pack in these unusual ways, these sickling configurations, now can result in a pathological outcome that can be multi-organ involvement. It can be affecting the heart, the circulatory system, the musculature, the liver, the kidneys. So now you get a multiple organ influence from a biochemical uniqueness that's encoded in the genes of these individuals who's triggered into this pathological state by environmental factors. So here's our genes and environment connection that's starting to emerge through the concept of sickle cell anemia. And we recognize these are inherited susceptibility factors. It doesn't mean that a person who has these genes for sickling situations will necessarily be in crisis. What it means is they have an increased susceptibility to certain environmental factors. Well, from that interesting paper published in 1949, the companion paper that followed it is to me one of the most dramatic AHA papers that's appeared in the literature, and it comes from the pen of Dr. Linus Pauling working with his postdoctoral student, Dr. Harvey Itano. And this article is entitled, Sickle Cell Anemia, a Molecular Disease. And this is the first time, as far as I know, that the term molecular disease was used in the English-speaking literature, following on from Archibald Garant's work, really, that had been done way back when at the turn of the 20th century. 
And in this particular case, Dr. Pauling, then a professor at California Institute of Technology, developed an extraordinary way of looking at these sickling cells. Being a chemist, he looked at the uniqueness of these red cells and said, what do they have in them that other cells don't have? And of course, all of us know that they have hemoglobin. And hemoglobin is an iron porphyrin molecule, and iron is a ferromagnetic element. It has effects in magnetic fields. And so he was able to demonstrate that there were different spin states of the iron and hemoglobin in the sickle cells versus that that were in the normal red cells. And by utilizing a very interesting way of evaluating the effect of cells by a magnetic field, he was able to start differentiating cells that would be sickled versus those not sickled and start looking at the actual chemistry of how this whole process of altered hemoglobin was formed in the sickle cell individual. And eventually, because he was also a protein chemist and very interested in the structure function, able to isolate and analyze the protein structure of the beta globulin molecule of hemoglobin and found that there was a single cell substitution mutation. And as a consequence of this mutation of one amino acid for another, that single change in this large chain of amino acids was at a critical point of the structure of that protein, causing that globular protein as part of the hemoglobin molecule to then change the whole structure of hemoglobin to make it more able to be packed into this configuration that led to sickling and ultimately distorting the shape of the whole red cell. Now it looks like a sickle and it cuts its way through the vasculature, causing pathology when it starts packing together. So this concept that a single amino acid change caused by a single gene alteration could lead then into a very serious series of crises and diseases that cut across multiple organs for which he called this a molecular disease, was a major paradigm shift in thinking about the origin of disease. Recall, if you would, the major theme about the origin of disease to that point was infectious disease. And that was a major, obviously, breakthrough in understanding the origin of disease at the turn of the last century with Louis Pasteur and others who had really helped us to understand that certain bugs can cause disease through this process of infection and the interrelationship with the immune system and so forth. So from that was later then born this additional concept of the origin of disease, this genetic metabolism disease, where genes and environment interrelate to give rise to the expression of an outcome in the phenotype called a disease, in this case, a sickling crisis. So this follows on nicely, this intellectual lineage, from that of the soil that was first prepared by Archibald Garan. In that same period of time, in the 1949 period of time, just to show you how there's consanguous concepts of discovery that occur in great epic periods, another well-known figure, the member that we would consider one of the founding fathers of functional medicine was doing his work, and this is Dr. Roger Williams, who at the time was working as a faculty member at the Clayton Foundation for Research in the Chemistry Department at the University of Texas, where he later was department chairman in Austin, Texas, and was an esteemed biochemist and actually credited with discovering panathenic acid and was one of those people who was considered at the top of his game, in fact, had been the president of the American Chemical Society, the professional society for chemists in the United States. And in the same period of time that Dr. Pauling is writing his paper with Dr. Atano on sickle cell anemia, molecular disease, this whole concept of genetic uniquenesses giving rise to single changes in proteins that give rise to the expression under certain environmental conditions of disease, Dr. Williams was then developing his concept of genetotropic disease. And genetic trophic disease is an extraordinary concept that at the time, I believe, published in 1950 for the first time in The Lancet. Once again, The Lancet, this was February 11th of 1950, a classic article. And what he goes on to say is that this theme of disease occurring as a consequence of genetic uniqueness and certain nutritional insufficiencies was another part of this paradigm-shifting discovery. And I quote from his paper, he says, based essentially upon recent findings in genetics and biochemistry, which have not yet been incorporated into medical thought, the concept of genetic trophic disease may, we believe, lead to an understanding of many diseases whose etiology is at present obscure, end quote. Now, what is this concept of genetotrophic disease? Well, this is the concept that we each have genetic uniqueness for many things, 
one of which is the need for specific nutrients to promote proper functional physiology. And if, in fact, those needs that we each individually have, based on our genetics, is not met, then the result could be dysfunctional metabolism, which over time can lead to disease. And this is very interesting if you think about it for a moment, because it almost goes back to H.P. Heim's work and his work, which was also published in the middle 1900s. You recall he is the head of the endocrinology department at the University of London School of Medicine, very highly esteemed director of medical research in England at the time. He is credited as discovering metabolic syndrome and insulin resistance. He went on to say, the history of modern knowledge is concerned in no small degree with man's attempt to escape from his previous concepts, end quote. That's when he was talking about insulin resistance and hyperinsulinemia as a different form of diabetes than that of just frank insulin deficiency, what we now later to be called type 1 diabetes. So again, he said the history of modern knowledge is concerned in no small way with man's attempt to escape from his previous concepts because he had a hard time getting his colleagues to understand there could be a second type of diabetes that was associated not with the deficiency of insulin, but an insufficiency of insulin promoting proper signaling or proper function. So all of this was occurring at the same time. And in fact, Williams quotes Himesworth when he talks about the paradigm shifting concept of a genetotrophic disease in this fantastic article that appeared in The Lancet in 1950. And in fact, he even goes on in this article to talk about etiology of diseases like heart disease, diabetes, and arthritis, and other conditions like alcoholism having their root origin in genetic uniqueness and nutritional insufficiency based upon the individual's own uniqueness that is not being met by their nutritional intake. In fact, in this 1950 article, Dr. Williams also goes on to talk about mental disease and various types of things like schizophrenia may be a result of the inadequacy of specific nutrients to the genetic need of that individual. And he says, and I quote, there is a prodigious amount of data to indicate combined genetic and nutritional influences in many forms of mental disease that an entire volume might be written on this topic alone. For many years, it's been seen that there are forms of dementia and other nutritional associated symptoms of mental illness that could be tracked back to genetics not being adequately supported by proper nutrition, end quote. So I think that we're witnessing now in the 21st century a revisiting, a rediscovery of these paradigms that were developed really from the work of people like Archibald Garrod and later Dr. Pauling and Dr. Williams. In fact, Dr. Williams takes this concept of genetotropic disease on to an even more descriptive level in a wonderful review article that he authored in Nutrition Reviews. Actually, this is in September of 1950. This is volume eight, early on in the first publications of Nutrition Reviews, in which he talks about the extraordinary research that's in the literature that he believes supports the concepts of genetic uniqueness and what he later called biochemical individuality. That takes us up then to 1968. And 1968 is an epic landmark period in the history of our field and this whole nature of functional medicine because it was that year that Dr. Linus Pauling authored what I consider to be one of the great papers that sat in the literature for many years, probably not understood as well as it should in terms of its impact on the future trajectory of medicine. And this, again, appeared in Science Magazine, April 19, 1968, entitled Orthomolecular Psychiatry, varying the concentration of substances normally present in the human body may control mental disease, was the subtitle of this particular epic paper. And in this paper, Dr. Pauling talks really at the next level from that of Dr. Williams and genotrophic disease about optimizing molecular concentrations of what he called orthomolecular substances, substances that are native to the human body, and how that then influences enzyme function and how that enzyme function controls and regulates cellular activity in the phenotype of the individual, and how individuals with unique genetics might have enzymes that are slightly different in their structure and function from that of other individuals, and therefore their need for coenzymes to promote proper enzyme function may be slightly higher. This leads to the orthomolecular supplementation concept. Not that they're getting superordinate amounts of supplements, but they're getting the level of nutrients necessary under their unique genes to promote proper enzyme function. This is the application of Le Chatelet's principle. Remember the French chemist that died during the French Revolution 
whose concept was you apply stress to an equilibrium and the equilibrium moves in the direction to minimize the stress. That's kind of a metaphor, isn't it, to the French Revolution? But anyway, the chemistry outcome of that is you add more of your substrate and you push that then through the equilibrium dynamics onto more product. And in this case, increasing the activity and amount of a cofactor or coenzyme can promote more of the apoenzyme becoming the haloenzyme, the active enzyme, that then catalyzes that specific reaction. And this is the basis for things like the use of more B12 at hundreds of times the RDI for megaloblastic anemia or for the use of more B6 and folate for people with homocystemia. This is the specific applications of these conceptual framework that Dr. Pauling was speaking to. You can't change the genes, but you can change the environment that would then promote proper enzyme function. This concept that is described in orthomolecular psychiatry, this landmark paper, then leads us into a period of nearly 40 years of debate and controversy and up and down and, you know, what does this really mean? And it really led us into a moment in time that I think is one of those aha moments, which was the publication in 2002 of a review paper by Bruce Ames and Elon Elson Schwab and Eli Silver. This paper appeared in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition, volume 75, page 616 in 2002. And the title of this paper is High-Dose Vitamin Therapy Stimulating Variant Enzymes with Decreased Coenzyme Binding Affinity, Relevance to Genetic Disease and Polymorphisms. This is the review paper that was necessary to be written by a scholar such as Dr. Ames, an icon in the field, to help to support this whole lineage of the development of this theme since Archibald Garrod to Roger Williams and into Linus Pauling. In this review paper, which has 377 references, Dr. Ames and his co-authors do a brilliant job of really supporting this concept of genetotrophic disease, orthomolecular medicine, and molecular medicine as it pertains to the role that nutritional supplements can have in specific cases for promoting proper function. In fact, in this paper, he goes on to say, as many as one-third of mutations in a gene result in the corresponding enzyme having an increase in the Kalos constant. This means decreased binding affinity for its respective coenzyme, which is generally a vitamin derived. This results in a lower rate of reaction. About 50 human genetic diseases due to defective enzymes can be remediated or ameliorated by the administration, he says, of high doses of vitamin components of the corresponding coenzyme, which at least partially restores enzymatic activity. He then talks about single nucleotide polymorphisms in which the variant amino acid reduces coenzyme binding and thus enzymatic activity, and these can be remediable by raising cellular concentrations of the cofactor, the very concept that Linus Pauling discussed in 1968 in his science article. He goes on then to talk about many, many examples of this and many applications of this clinically that have been proven in the literature. And with 377 references, anyone that says there's no science needs to do their homework. So that leads us now into the 21st century with this whole development of nutrigenomics and nutriproteomics and nutrimetabolomics and how this then really relates to individual need for nutrients to promote individual function. It ties to the vitamin C controversy. It ties to all the things that we have seen debated, including the niacin and schizophrenia controversy and the B6 and folate controversy to homocystemia, all the things that are still being debated today. With that, let's go to the father of this whole concept, Dr. Linus Pauling, and hear what he had to say in 1982. Hello, I'm Dr. Jeff Bland. I'm a senior research fellow at the Linus Pauling Institute of Science and Medicine, and it's a great pleasure today to be with Dr. Linus Pauling the chairman of the board and the chief visionary influence on the Linus Pauling Institute's activities. I'm here today to really engage in a fireside chat with Dr. Pauling to discuss some of the areas of his interest and some of his research progress that he's making and hopefully acquaint you with some of the things that are not only going on here at the Institute but in the field of science and healthcare in general. So let me thank Dr. Pauling very much for being with us today and for sharing this moment of his precious time. Nice to have you with us, Dr. Pauling. Well, thank you. I'm glad to be here. I'm going to start, if I could, just for the sake of the listeners, asking you if you might review for us some of your recent activities. I know you've been traveling all around. You've been speaking to many groups. I'm sure we'd all like to hear some of the things that have occupied your time. Well, you know, 
I divide my time, it turns out, into thirds. One third of the time I work on uh, basic problems of science, uh, which I've been interested in for a long time, since 1922 when I carried out my first research. So I still make quantum mechanical calculations about molecular structures and crystal structure, the nature of metals, and uh, the structure of nuclei. Then one-third of my time is devoted to collaborating with other people here in the Linus Pauling Institute in our attack on medical problems. Right now, we are just finishing up a big study of uh, the effectiveness of vitamin C in controlling cancer in mice. It's turned out, I'm glad to say, that the vitamin C has a great value. It uh, slows down greatly the development of spontaneous breast cancer in a strain of mice that develop these cancers. I collaborate with many people in the Institute in their researches, in considerable part by talking with them about what they are doing and giving them advice, perhaps, or making suggestions on the basis of my years of experience. The job of answering letters from people who write in for advice is a considerable one that takes up a good bit of my time. Then, the other third of my time, I travel. I travel uh, to give talks largely about vitamins and health, or about health in general, especially in relation to nutrition. Some of them about world peace, because why should I be working on improving the health of people if the world is going to be destroyed in a great nuclear war? We need to have a future to believe that we are going to have a future, that the human race will have a future in order to justify our trying to control cancer and heart disease and other diseases. And, of course, some of the talks that I give on these trips that I take are about science. I'd like, if I could, to sort of switch the topic and ask you, you alluded to this exciting study uh, here at the Institute that's been ongoing for a couple of years as it relates to vitamin C's impact upon spontaneous mammary cancer in mice, and that's but one of a number of exciting types of work that are going on in the Institute. I'm sure that our listeners would like to hear a little bit more about some of the other things happening at the Institute. Could you say a few words about that? Well, some of the investigators in the Institute are working on the question of just what is cancer? How does cancer originate in the human body? During recent years, the last 20 years, it has been possible to get information about genetic influences, about the role of genes, which are polynucleotides, DNA strings, strings of DNA molecules in causing cancer and uh, in achieving almost everything else that goes on in the human body. So our investigators have been involved in the recent work on oncogenes. Oncogenes are genes that are involved in cancer. And they are closely related to genes that are present in every human being or in every animal of the species under study. When one of these pro-oncogenes, a gene that might become an oncogene, undergoes a genetic mutation, it becomes an oncogene, a gene that changes the nature of the organism in such a way that a cancer develops, or uh, there may be some second effect that also must occur. More than one change is usually involved in the production of cancer. So this very modern technique of studying the DNA molecules that determine the nature of an individual human being, including 
the cancers that he might produce is being used by workers, investigators in our institute. A different attack is being made by uh, Dr. Constance Tsao and her associates. This is to study certain chemical substances that are produced by oxidation of vitamin C. It was discovered 10 or 15 years ago by Dr. Omura, well, in fact, by his teacher, but he who then retired, and Dr. Omura has continued, that oxidation products of vitamin C, which are formed in the human body after vitamin C is ingested, have greater anti-cancer activity in animals than vitamin C itself has. This hasn't been followed up by anyone. There are a number of these oxidation products, different substances that you get by a reaction of vitamin C and oxygen. We don't know whether all of them have a greater anti-cancer activity than vitamin C or only one or two of them. And we don't understand at all how they work in controlling cancer. It may turn out that much of the anti-cancer activity of vitamin C results from its oxidation in the human body to these oxidation products. So I have a hope that this will turn out to be a really significant effort that will lead to an advance in our ability to control cancer. Vitamin C itself, of course, works in other ways than just through the oxidation products. It is required for the efficient operation of the immune system. We know that when the immune system is functioning well, the probability of uh, dying from cancer is less than when the immune system is not functioning well. After an operation for removal of a cancer, in almost every patient, there are in the bloodstream millions of malignant cells. And yet only some of these patients then later develop metastatic cancer. Others do not. Uh, why? Uh, it is believed, and I think quite rightly, that if your immune system is working well, then that system can detect the malignant cells, prepare them for destruction, and then carry out their destruction. And so in the people who have a well-working immune system, the malignant cells are destroyed and metastases do not occur. Vitamin C is known to potentiate the immune system in various ways. An English investigator named Balance showed that more antibodies that can identify the malignant cells are formed with a high intake of vitamin C than with a low intake. More molecules of complement are formed as a result of additional vitamin C. Molecules of complement have to attach themselves to the complex of a malignant cell or group of malignant cells and antibodies in order that these malignant cells be destroyed. So with a high intake of vitamin C, you produce more of the T lymphocytes that can destroy these marked malignant cells, the complex of the antibodies complement and the malignant cells. And it's been known for... 40 years now, more than 40 years, and nearly 50 years, that vitamin C is required in these T lymphocytes, in phagocytes, and white cells generally, in order that they be able to destroy infected cells and malignant cells. Vitamin C is intimately involved in the process of protecting the human body against infections and against malignancies because the only way the human body has of destroying these infected cells and malignant cells 
is with use of vitamin C. So vitamin C is important to cancer in many ways. Well, now we are just embarking on a new project that I am especially interested in. This is vitamin C in relation to heart disease. Evidence has been turning up during recent years about the involvement of vitamin C in heart disease. There is a good correlation between incidence of heart disease and the amount of cholesterol in the body. And also the amount of low-density lipoprotein. This low-density lipoprotein is the protein consists of molecules that can carry cholesterol molecules out to cells in the body where they are required for proper functioning of the cells. Cholesterol is a very important substance. Sometimes, however, the amount of cholesterol is too great and it gets involved in laying down plaques in the blood vessels. There is another protein, a lipoprotein, whose molecules have the function of picking up cholesterol and carrying it back to the organs where it is destroyed and the liver converted into bile acids that are then eliminated from the body. Well, vitamin C has been shown to speed up the rate of conversion of cholesterol to bile acids. And that means you're bleeding off the cholesterol so that the level in the body goes down. It has also been shown to cause the production of more high-density lipoprotein. That means you have more of the protein that removes cholesterol from the blood vessels and carries it to the liver to be destroyed. Also, it cuts down, slows down the rate of production of low-density lipoprotein so that you have a smaller number of the molecules that carry the cholesterol out to the blood vessels where the plaques can be formed. It also cuts down the amount of triglycerides in the blood, and there's a correlation between triglycerides and heart attacks. So with all of these correlations, we can see cutting down the total cholesterol, the low-density lipoprotein, and the triglycerides, and increasing the high-density lipoprotein, and speeding up the rate of destruction of the cholesterol, converting it to bile acids, we can see that vitamin C might well be correlated in a very striking way with heart disease. A high intake of vitamin C may turn out to be the best way of protecting yourself against heart disease. Our epidemiological associate, Dr. James Enstrom, has published a paper describing a study that he made of several hundred people who had been ingesting larger amounts of vitamin C than the population as a whole. On the average, about a gram and a half of 1,500 milligrams of vitamin C. And they had only about half the probability of dying of heart disease at each age as the control population, similar subpopulations in California who were on an ordinary diet with an ordinary intake of vitamin C. There are other differences between the two populations that he compared, but it seems likely that this high intake of vitamin C is largely responsible for their having half as much mortality from heart disease, age-standardized, age-corrected mortality. Well, they had only half as much mortality from cancer, too, and from other diseases. Vitamin C is not a specific remedy, a wonder drug against cancer or against the common cold or against the flu or hepatitis or viral pneumonia or herpes infections or heart disease. It's not a specific wonder drug, 
what it does is to build up the human body to the state of health that all human beings ought to be in. When I read what the Food and Nutrition Board says, that 60 milligrams of vitamin C a day is enough for all persons in ordinary good health, I think they should say all persons in ordinary poor health. If you want to be in what ought to be ordinary good health, you have to take additional vitamin C. Of course, I believe that the arguments that support this conclusion are really thoroughly convincing. They are the sort of arguments that appeal to me as a scientist. I am accustomed to looking at the facts and trying to draw some logical conclusions from them. Other people perhaps are not so accustomed to doing that. I would say that the evidence that high intake, many times the usually recommended amount, the RDA, of vitamin C, is needed for good health. That conclusion is thoroughly justified by the evidence. I'd like to respond and say that this relationship between vitamin C and heart disease is a very interesting controversy recently in the literature that I believe falls right in line with what you're talking about, that some people interpret data differently. There was a report in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition by some supposed responsible investigators saying that vitamin C did not increase high-density lipoprotein cholesterol and did not lower total cholesterol. However, in examining the protocol of the study, it was found that the average starting cholesterol of this group was about three-quarters the value of the standard average American cholesterol level, meaning it was about 175, where the normal value is about 220 for the average person. And it had already been pointed out in 1976 through another series of investigations that vitamin C is most effective in lowering cholesterol and raising HDL when a person has an elevated blood cholesterol level, meaning that the study population selected in this study was already almost guaranteed to show a negative result, which I found to be something that was either naivete on the part of the investigators or more likely that they were trying to make a certain political statement through the misuse of science. Yes. It's, um, it is true that if you want to find out what some investigators have observed, you have to go back and read their entire paper, not just read a statement that someone has made, even the investigators themselves have made, about what results they have obtained, so that people are often misled by statements that some investigator showed that this substance did not have any value, when in fact he had observed some value, but not so great as he had expected to observe, or when the number of subjects was so small that he was not able to show with statistical significance that there was a positive effect. Very often the mistake is made that when an investigator has used a certain number of subjects, which might be rather small, and has failed to show benefit from the treatment at what is considered a statistically significant level, the results are described as his having shown that there was no effect, when in fact he hadn't shown that there was no effect. He had just not succeeded in showing that there was an effect. And the statistical treatment that you give if you are trying to answer these two questions is quite different. One of the most common questions, Dr. Pauling, that the average person asks about vitamin C therapy, particularly today in light of a lot of the published information in the wire service and in magazines and newspapers, is surrounding vitamin C's supposed toxic effects. And I think that there are several notable reports that have occurred in the literature lately. I know you responded to one very, responded very eloquently to a paper that appeared in seminars in oncology recently by Dr. Mary Sistelli, who's commented that vitamin C has toxic effects potentially when used in cancer therapy. And you've also previously responded to Dr. Victor Herbert, a hematologist who says that vitamin C supplementation may destroy vitamin B12. We also hear that 
Vitamin C supplementation supposedly causes kidney stones through its metabolism to oxalate. And recently there has been the report by a Professor Cherluski at Oregon State University that somehow vitamin C supplement causes an antagonism of copper metabolism in the body and leads to copper deficiency anemia. I think it would be very useful for our listeners to sort of put this into perspective. Could you comment on vitamin C's toxicity for us? Well, human beings differ from one another. There may well be a few human beings who should not take very large doses of vitamin C. But they are so rare, in my opinion, that it's justified for me to say that vitamin C is essentially completely non-toxic. Some of the arguments that have been presented are based on a misunderstanding. We know that the common sort of kidney stone has a greater tendency to form in alkaline urine than in acidic urine, but uncommon forms have a greater tendency to form in acidic union. When my book, Vitamin C and the Common Cold, came out, it was immediately attacked in a publication, mainly for doctors. The statement was made that vitamin C in the form of ascorbic acid keeps the urine acidic and so increases the tendency to form certain kinds of kidney stones, the less common kinds. Well, that is true, but it isn't an effect of vitamin C. Vitamin C is the ascorbate ion. You can't take pure vitamin C because you can't get hold of a large aggregate of negatively charged ions. There always is a positive ion along with them. And that can be either hydrogen ion or sodium ion or calcium ion or some other ion. Ordinary vitamin C tablets contain ascorbic acid, which is vitamin C with hydrogen ion, and they make the urine acidic. It isn't the vitamin C, then, that increases the tendency to form these uncommon stones. It's the hydrogen ion that you're taking along with the ascorbate ion. But to keep the urine acidic decreases the tendency to form the common stones. If you know that not many people form stones anyway, but fewer still know what kind they might have a tendency to form. If you happen to know that you have a tendency to form common kidney stones, then you would be wise to take ascorbic acid, uh, vitamin C in the form of ascorbic acid, the common way in which it's available, or to take some other acidifying agent. But ascorbic acid is the best thing to take to cut down the chance of farming the common kidney stones. If you know, if you have farmed one of the uncommon kind, then the doctor may well advise you to keep the urine alkaline. You could take baking soda as an alkalinizing agent, or you can take sodium ascorbate. And when you take sodium ascorbate, you are not only protecting yourself to some extent against farming additional kidney stones of that uncommon kind, but you are also benefiting from the vitamin C. With the oxalate stones, there may be one person described in the medical literature as having an oxalate stone farmed because of the large volume amount of vitamin C that he took. That's possibly a real effect for that person of a special genotype. The number of these cases is so small that I don't think that is a reason not to take vitamin C. Now, for some of these other statements, Dr. Victor Herbert saying that vitamin C destroys vitamin B12 and you may get pernicious anemia was based on an error that he and his associate made when they analyzed their foods for vitamin B12. They just didn't use the standard procedure for making the analysis for vitamin B12. And when the other investigators repeated their work, when they used Dr. Herbert's method, they got the same results he had got. But when they used the standard method, they found that practically none of 
vitamin B12 had been destroyed. Only a small amount of loosely bound vitamin B12 had been destroyed, so that the statement that vitamin C can cause pernicious anemia or B12 deficiency anemia is just not in accordance with the facts. It was based on an error. With the investigator in Oregon State University, Dr. Chernusky, who reported that the copper level in the blood went down when the subjects were given large doses of vitamin C, the situation has been exacerbated by a writer in the popular newspapers who misrepresented Dr. Chernusky's work. First, he said that Dr. Chernusky took the subjects off the vitamin C after 60 days or whatever period in order to protect them from dying of anemia. Dr. Chernusky says this just isn't true. He said that in his paper, he mentioned the possibility that this lower copper level would lead to an iron deficiency anemia, to the failure to incorporate iron in the red blood cells, in the hemoglobin for the red blood cells. But he didn't think that it would occur. He just mentioned that as, as a possibility. So the scare statements that you will you'll get anemia, die of anemia, if you take large doses of vitamin C, are not justified by the statements of the investigator himself. Vitamin C improves the workings of the human body so much that it may well be that people will produce as much hemoglobin as they need, even though their copper levels are somewhat less than in other people are on a, when they are on a smaller intake of vitamin C. So there's no evidence really to support that conclusion about vitamin C and anemia. The same thing is true for many other statements that are made about possible dangers of vitamin C, one of which is that if you take large doses of vitamin C and then stop, you will develop scurvy. Or if a mother, a pregnant woman, takes large doses, the child is apt to have a special need for vitamin C such that the child will be scorbutic on the ordinary intake of vitamin C that would not permit scurvy to develop. There just is no evidence to support this. There is a rebound effect which, in fact, was discovered 10 years ago by Miles Hushitz and me. It's a rebound effect that occurs after you have been taking large doses of vitamin C and stop suddenly. The level in the blood goes below that corresponding to the ordinary low intake, and it stays low for a few days. I recommend that people taper off if they want to stop a large dose instead of stopping. But Dr. Anderson in Toronto carried out a study in which he checked whether people have an increased probability of developing the common cold, respiratory illness during this period after they've stopped a large intake than they have ordinarily on the ordinary low intake. And he found he couldn't detect any increased incidence of respiratory illness during this period when the level in the blood is lower than usual. So there is an effect. It's not an important effect. Nevertheless, I suggest that people should taper off over a period of a week or two if they have been taking large doses. And then I say, but better still, don't stop the large doses. If you go to the hospital, if a patient goes to the hospital, a person who has been taking supplementary vitamins, the doctor is apt to stop the supplementary vitamins. This is wrong. The doctors should be giving larger amounts of vitamin C and other vitamins to patients in hospitals. You know, here we are troubled about the fact that the cost of medical care 
in the United States is very high. We're spending hundreds of billions of dollars on medical care, hospital care, six, seven, eight hundred dollars a day for patients in the hospital. It's been known for 40 years that you can cut down the length of stay in the hospital by two or three or four days or by 30 or 40 or 50 percent for a longer stay if the patient receives large amounts of vitamin C. After a surgical operation, the wounds heal faster with vitamin C. It's been known for about 50 years that vitamin C is required for wound healing. You can't manufacture collagen, connective tissue, scar tissue. You just can't heal wounds if you don't have vitamin C. When a person not getting vitamin C begins to die of scurvy, if he has an old scar, it's apt to break open again because he's not manufacturing collagen. And in fact, his joints fall apart, his blood vessels burst because he's not making the collagen, which is required for the strength of these organs and tissues. And vitamin C is needed, absolutely needed, to make collagen. So your body is stronger when you take vitamin C. Now, about what my associates are doing. Dr. Cameron, when he first gave large doses of vitamin C to terminal cancer patients in Scotland, and he deserves credit for having discovered by his clinical observations that vitamin C really has value for cancer patients, one of the things that Dr. Cameron noticed was that the patients said, Doctor, I feel so strong. They not only didn't feel sick, have this cachexia, just feeling miserable, that's characteristic of cancer, and not only developed good appetites instead of being anorectic, not able to eat because the food didn't taste good, but they also got strong. Dr. Cameron wondered, what can vitamin C be doing that makes the patients say that they feel strong? And they were strong. He mentions that one of his patients in Scotland liked to play golf, was able to lower his golf score after he got out of the hospital. And another retired man took on the job of chopping wood, not as a job, but just because he liked doing it. He felt strong and he brought chopped wood around to Dr. Cameron and other people. Also, Cameron noticed that in the accounts of scurvy, when sailors used to die on ships with scurvy, the first sign of the scurvy was lassitude and lack of muscular strength. And then the body began falling apart. Later, the gums ulcerated and the teeth fell out and the joints and so on, and the person died. Well, what about this lack of muscular strength and regaining strength in Cameron's patients? There's a simple chemical substance named carnitine, which is present in muscle juice to the extent of about 1%. If you squeeze meat, the juice that you get out contains carnitine. Carnitine is required for muscular activity. You know, you burn fuel in the body to provide the energy for muscular work. And this is burned in the cells, in the muscle. The fuel that you burn is fat, at least one of the fuels. Carnitine is required to carry molecules of fat into these cells where they can be burned to provide muscular energy. Just a couple of years ago, a biochemist showed that carnitine can be made from lysine, an amino acid present in the body and present in meat too, lysine by chemical reactions that take place in the human body, catalyzed by certain enzymes, two of which are hydroxylation reactions that require vitamin C. You can't make carnitine from lysine without vitamin C. The fact that people sometimes say, I have to eat red meat to be strong, may be that they are getting carnitine from the meat 
and that helps them to be strong. Or also getting lysine, which is present in larger amounts in meat protein than in vegetable protein. And if they have enough vitamin C, they can convert the lysine to carnitine and thus have even greater muscular strength. So one of the investigations that we are carrying out as a result of the various observations by Dr. Cameron and by others is to study human beings. How much carnitine is in their bodies? How much is floating around in the blood? And if you give a person extra lysine and extra vitamin C, does he then produce more carnitine and become stronger, too? Dr. Pauling, one of the other very commonly asked questions surrounding vitamin C's use in supplemental doses has to do with another antioxidant, knowing that vitamin C is considered a biological antioxidant that works in the water-soluble portion of cells. This other antioxidant is the trace element selenium, which is receiving quite a bit of attention recently because it's supposedly a cancer preventive nutrient. It's been suggested by Dr. Walter Mertz at the USDA that high-dose vitamin C therapy antagonizes selenium status or at least prevents selenium absorption from the diet. Do you have any comments on that relationship? Well, I'm not sure that my comments are as significant as those that you would make. I would think that selenate or selenite might well be reduced to elementary selenium by ascorbate, that selenium in an organic molecule, such as selenomethionine or some other organic compound, would probably not be affected by the ascorbate. But I'd be interested to know your opinion on this point. I concur with your comment. In fact, the paper in which the oxidation reduction relationships between inorganic selenium as selenite, selenate, and selenous acid in vitamin C and the organoselenium as selenium methionine, selenium cysteine, confirmed exactly what you just pointed out, and that is that there was not a reduction in the organic forms of selenium to selenium metal where there was in the inorganic selenite, selenate form. So it would seem to me that if you were supplementing with a sodium selenite preparation and taking high-dose vitamin C, that you may render some of the selenium unabsorbable, but if you were taking the organically bound form, it would be a very small probability of reaction. Yes, and of course, in the organically bound form, probably is selenium minus one already as far reduced as possible so that the scarbate couldn't reduce it any further. Exactly right. One of the other things quickly that you might want to comment on is the suggestion that you can utilize a fat-soluble form of ascorbate called ascorbyl palmitate, where the ascorbic acid molecule is esterified to palmitic acid, and that this is supposedly a very useful antioxidant in the fat-soluble milieu of cells, that you should be taking a supplement of ascorbyl palmitate. Do you have any comment on that? I would need to be convinced that that fat-soluble form of ascorbate if we are taking enough of the fat-soluble antioxidant, vitamin E, so my recommendation would be to spend your money on vitamin E and save money by buying the cheap form of vitamin C rather than to buy a more expensive form of vitamin C. Moreover, I don't think anyone should rely entirely on this fat-soluble form. It might be taken as an adjunct to a good amount of ascorbate itself, ascorbic acid or sodium ascorbate or calcium ascorbate itself. What dosage level would be considered for the average consumer who is reasonably, well, let's say not sick, what dosage level of vitamin C would be considered at a range that they would have concern about excessive intake. Is there some range that we might say for the average person would be in the desirable range? Well, vitamin C isn't very expensive. What I buy costs about a cent and a half a gram, the ascorbic acid crystals, and the one gram tablets you can get for around three cents a tablet, three cents a gram. So it isn't very expensive. My 12 grams a day comes to about 18 cents a day. 
Nevertheless, people may not want to spend too much money on vitamins. I say a little extra vitamin C does a lot of good. To take even 250 or 500 milligrams does a lot of good. To take 1,000 milligrams a day does more good. To take 5,000, 10,000 milligrams still more good. But in general, I don't complain about a person's telling me that he takes 2,000 milligrams a day. Uh, as people get older, I think it would be wise for them to increase the intake. I've already mentioned, I think, the 12 grams, 12,000 milligrams that I take is probably the right physiological amount. You can get along pretty well with a somewhat smaller amount. I think that's the right one. Now, a person can find his own upper limit from the gastrointestinal response that was observed 10 years ago by Dr. Cameron and more recently by Dr. Cathcart. Dr. Cameron observed that a sick person can take much larger amounts of vitamin C by mouth without its acting as a laxative or having too much of a laxative effect, producing looseness of the bowel, than the same person when he gets well. Consequently, it might be good for a person to find out what his gastrointestinal limit is. And if it's unusually high, it may well mean that he has a special need for vitamin C, that he is really not in the best of health. I can take only about 12 grams a day. Well, I could take more if I split it up into a succession of small doses, but not much more. Some people can take 20 or 30 grams a day before they get this response, even though they consider that they are in good health. A really sick person, Dr. Cathcart reported, might have to take as much as 200 grams in a day to get this response. But he can't do that day after day. In a few days, he's well if he has mononucleosis or hepatitis, some such disease, and has had to cut down his intake. This man who comes to see me every few months, the chemist down in San Jose, still has metastatic cancer. And it's clear that he is not well, both because you can see the metastases when he has CAT scans made, also because he can take his 130 grams a day without having far too much looseness of the bowels. So he's not well. He's able to work to stay alive now for eight years, but he hasn't been able to get rid of the cancer and get back into good health. Some people do apparently succeed in, in that. I know that the listeners would probably like this to go on indefinitely, but we certainly have to recognize that you have many, many other responsibilities today, and we appreciate your time. I would like, however, to leave with one last question being put to you before we have a chance to get together to do this in the future, and that is, I think a lot of people see the rate of change of information occurring and the, the, how quickly science is evolving and developing, and we all probably feel a little bit of a state of overwhelm. As a visionary, as a person who has been a major contributor to the field of science and healthcare and had your finger on the pulse of what's been happening for 70 plus years, what is your vision as to what's occurring right now and a future that you see for healthcare? I think that it will be recognized before long that the greatest contribution to medicine made in the last quarter of the 20th century is the recognition that nutrition, including nutritional supplements, can be used in a far more effective way to improve health, prevent disease, and even in the treatment of disease, usually as an adjunct to conventional therapy, than had been possible than it had been used in the past. And in particular, I think vitamin C, which is unique among the vitamins in two or three respects, will be found to have very great value. The estimate that I have made about the value of nutritional supplements, vitamin C, and some other health practices has been 
increasing. That is, the value, of my estimate of the value, has been getting greater year after year. So that in an article that I wrote recently, I made the estimate that in this way it should be possible to increase the length of the period of well-being and the length of life by 35 years, which would mean around 110 years as a life expectancy rather than 75 years. And this, I feel, is desirable. There are periods in life when you are miserable. When you are young, you are miserable. At least I was miserable before I found the proper relationship to the world as a whole, to the opposite sex and so on. I was not happy as a child. I was a teenager. I was miserable. And I expect that there may well be a period of misery associated with the decline in health that culminates in death. Maybe that this can be shortened, this second period of misery. The first, I think, has got worse in the last 20 years with the relaxation of the social pressures on young people to behave that kept them from getting involved with problems so intimately uh, that they are, as they are now involved. So I believe that we can then increase the length of the period of well-being with respect to the period of less well-being. That is, we'll win out in this way by being happier over a greater fraction of our lives than at the present time. The December 2009 edition of Functional Medicine Update will continue on Part 2. This is the end of Part 1. So now going from this extraordinary discussion with Dr. Linus Pauling concerning his view of orthomolecular medicine, vitamin C, and the future of this molecular medicine concept, let's move to the next important founding father of this concept in the 20th century, and that's Dr. Abram Hoffer, who, as you know, as a psychiatrist and a Ph.D. in chemistry, birthed the concept of orthomolecular psychiatry and also was in practice seeing patients up to the end of his life, an incredible contributor to our field, and who I had the great fortune of being able to interview just very shortly before his transition moving on. So with that, let's talk in the 21st century with Dr. Abram Hoffer and his view of this whole field. Well, this is a great privilege for me. Uh, I'm representing the Institute for Functional Medicine, and as you know, we've been very fortunate in the Institute for Functional Medicine for the past 14 years to every year honor someone who we feel has provided meritorious distinction in the field of functional medicine. And we've named this award under the terms of a person who is really one of the founding fathers of functional medicine, and that's Dr. Linus Pauling. There's probably no fitting recipient that would be more deserving for this Linus Pauling Award than the person that I'm so privileged to be able to honor today, and that's Dr. Abram Hoffer. Dr. Hoffer, this is the 14th Linus Pauling Functional Medicine Award. We wanted to kind of save it when it got rich enough it was really worth something, and we think that you, as one of the what we call founding fathers of the whole paradigm upon which functional medicine is built, really represents the core of what we're trying to teach doctors in the future. As the plaque says, For a lifetime of pioneering work that has elucidated the important role of biochemical uniqueness and orthomolecular therapies in a wide variety of chronic mental health conditions, the Institute recognizes Dr. Abram Hoffer's significant contribution to the evolution of functional medicine's knowledge and intellectual architecture for the prevention and treatment of complex mental health disorders. We want to thank you for your many decades of extraordinary leadership in developing this field. Dr. Bland, thank you very much. This is one of the highest honors I had ever expected to receive. Linus was a fantastic person, a major fantastic person, my mentor, and I think he not only changed medicine, he certainly changed my life as well. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much. Well deserved, and as I said, there would be no functional medicine if it were not for Abram Hoffer, Linus Pauling, Roger Williams. Thank you. So this is a really special opportunity, Dr. Hoffer, for me. As you probably know, I've valued as have literally tens of thousands of practitioners from your work and your insight and 
to sit down in your office here in Victoria, British Columbia, and know that you're still practicing psychiatry at the level of wisdom that you can bring to this discipline is, uh, is absolutely amazing. It's something that we all aspire to do in our own professional lives. Not many of us will be as successful in creating a whole new concept as you've created, but certainly your model of stick to itness and discipline and dedication to your patients is a model for all of us. So I'd like to just start. We can go all the way back, obviously, to before 1957. But 1957, for me, is kind of where I started my understanding of you by reading your first paper published on niacin and schizophrenia. Right. How would a psychiatrist even be interested in niacin? Well, I would say, luckily for me, Jeff, I got my first degree as a Ph.D. And later on, I got my M.D. Now, there's a different set, as you know. You're taught how to do things differently. A Ph.D. is taught how to think, and a doctor is taught how to remember. And having taken my Ph.D. first, it was a great thing for me to have done it that way. And after I was made Director of Psychiatric Research for the province of Saskatchewan in 1950, I had the following qualification. I knew absolutely nothing about psychiatry, which I think, looking back on it, was superb, because I hadn't been taught all the things that you could not do. And so it was my job to do something about these poor schizophrenic patients. Half of them in our mental hospitals would never get out. None of them would get out. We had no treatment. It was absolutely awful what happened to them. Luckily, at this time, Dr. Humphrey Osmond was brought out from England. We were desperately short of doctors to man our mental hospitals in Saskatchewan. And Dr. Osmond came out, and I didn't know he was coming, nor did he know that I was interested in research. But when he arrived in the fall of 1951, a very hot, dusty Saskatchewan day, I met him in Dr. McCarricker's office in Regina. And it turned out that he brought with him a very important paper. He and his friend John Smithies, John Smithies is still alive, living in California, they had done some work with mescaline, the active principle of peyote. And they had concluded that the experience induced by mescaline was in many ways similar to the one induced by schizophrenia. Now, this was an interesting observation. It had been made before by another doctor, but Dr. Taylor Stocking, some years before. But what he and John Smith did was even more unique after that. They then looked up the chemical structures of mescaline, which in many ways is similar to adrenaline. It's what you might call a catecholamine. And so they concluded with the question, was it possible that in the body of the schizophrenic patient there might be a compound with the properties of mescaline and some similarity in structure to adrenaline? And he brought that paper with him. Now, he had first presented that idea in England, but they thought it was so absolutely awful that he was totally rejected. And he was so unhappy at this that he told his wife that he would have to get out of England as far as he could. And when he saw in the London Times an ad asking for psychiatrists to come to Saskatchewan, he said to his wife, that's far enough, I think I can go there. So he came there hoping that he could do some research. We met, and after we learned how to understand each other, because he spoke with an English accent and I spoke with a prairie accent. So after we learned to communicate, we became very close friends. So I looked at the idea very carefully, and it made sense. It made so much sense. And so I began to, since I was in charge of the research and had time to do the reading and the study and collecting money, all the other stuff you have to do. So I looked up the formula of all the known at that time hallucinogens, and they all had, and I remember distinctly that one day I'm sitting in my kitchen table, my wife's doing the dishes, and I'm sitting at the table, all covered with papers, and I'm drawing down formula, and I said, oh my God, there it is. They were indoles. They were indoles. And you know what that meant. Because there's a law in chemistry that compounds with similar structure tend to have similar properties. So I said, oh, God, there it is. So we said, we now have a new formula. The hypothesis will be look in the body for something which has the properties of mescaline and which is similar in structure to adrenaline. And it's got to be an indole. Now, indoles in the cells, there are many of them found in the body. As you know, they're made in the gut, and not all of them would be that important. So we had to narrow it down to indoles that might be derived from adrenaline. And in those days, there were only two that we knew about. One was called adrenochrome, which later on we discovered could be converted into adrenalutine, and the other one was, by theory, noradrenochrome. 
So that gave us the hypothesis. But we didn't really care about the hypothesis. We wanted the treatment. We didn't care about the hypothesis. I knew then that most hypotheses turn out to be dead wrong. That's the way it goes in medicine. We wanted a treatment. And since I had taken my PhD in Minnesota, and my PhD thesis had been on B-complex vitamins in wheat, I was familiar with the vitamins, and I knew all about pellagra and the diseases it causes. So we said to ourselves, well, let's try niacin. Maybe if we get niacin, we can protect the body against the impact of this hallucinogen that we thought was present, but we didn't know its structure. And we didn't know yet about that. So that's how we hit upon niacin. And I recall there was a very middle-aged woman. She was the head stenographer of a large company in Regina. She became paranoid. Right after the war, they used to have Christmas parties. One day after the party, this very moral, good woman got the idea that her boss was in love with her. They'd never had a relationship. And she became so depressed because she thought it was going to break up their marriage that she went into a deep depression, was admitted to our hospital under someone else. There she had shock treatment. She was better for six months. Then she went to another Christmas party. Same thing again. Went into depression, came back to the hospital again, had shock another time, nothing happened. And then she came under my care. So I said to myself, well, here's an ideal case. She's going to be number one. I'm not going to give her any more shock treatment. She already had three series. She hadn't responded. We had no drugs, no tranquilizers. We had barbiturates, and we had the narcotics. That's all we had. And so I started her on niacin. And uh, she'd like to take it. Most people didn't like to take the flushing kind. That's all we had. But anyway, she took it, and she gradually got better. And after about two or three months in the hospital... She's okay. Discharge her. A couple of years later, her sister brings her back again. She's getting paranoid once more. What happened? She had stopped taking her niacin. So I call her in the office, and I'm very rough, and I yell at her and tell her I'll do all sorts of terrible things to her, including shock if she doesn't go right back on the vitamins again. She went back on to the niacin. She gets well. After two years, she stops taking them. Another relapse. Same thing, put her back on ice, and she gets well. So now she stays on it, and after about five, six years on ice, and she says, Dr. Harper, she says, I've been doing so well now for four or five years, do you think it's okay to go off? I said, okay, let's try. And she went off her ice, and she remained well thereafter. She went back to her senior job, looking after 30 stenographers in this stenographic pool. Jeff, when you see one person like that get well, there's no doubt anymore. I mean, there is some doubt, but really there's no evidence for scientific doubt because if one person can do it, surely there are going to be more who are going to respond the same way. And that led us to our first controlled studies. And we did the first double by controlled studies in the history of psychiatry and the first in the United States. In England, they had done double blinds on arthritis, but they had never done any on any other field. So we were the first, and our double blind experiments showed that we could double the two-year recovery rate of patients when we gave them niacin or niacinamide compared to placebo controls. So that was basically how we got started. So we published that paper, and we were lucky we got that published because the editor was a close friend of mine. Otherwise, he wouldn't have taken it. So when I look back and I listen to your story, I'm reminded of so many interesting things. We could call them fortuitous or serendipitous or directive. So here is a person, in your case, that gets a Ph.D. in a chemical field and understands about pellagra and niacin as it relates to an entirely different field and discipline from that of psychiatry, then goes to medicine and focuses on psychiatry, and then because of a creative mind, makes the connection. And as I recall in your paper, you were maybe the first group to talk about the similarity between pellagra's dementia being schizophreniform with schizophrenia. That's and correct. So that connection is a brilliant leap of abstraction to most people. But yes. for you, it was clearly obvious. It was so terribly obvious, I didn't ever think people would object. I thought that would be looked upon as a hero. I said, oh my God, it's the guy that's going to love me now. By that time, I was very popular anyway, because I was doing a lot of nonsense research that didn't mean anything. And as long as I published papers that had no meaning, you know what I'm talking about. Yep. I was popular. But after we published that first paper that you read, guess what? They said, oh, my God, that guy's a heretic. 
And at that time, of course, as you know, the tranquilizers came in in 55, 56, 57, and they were financially so rewarding to the big drug companies that they overwhelmed the whole field. And today, psychiatry is owned by the big pharma. That's what's happened to psychiatry today. So as you made this discovery, I find it extraordinarily interesting from an intellectual development perspective that you took the pre pelagrus dementia connection to schizophrenia, and then you asked questions about, well, what other genetic metabolism disorders associated with nutrition can we think about that could have central nervous system effects, like hyperhomocystemia? Yeah. And then you talked about B6 and B12 and folate. So your model got extended, and it seemed to be able to be mapped against many of these conditions. Well, that's true, and that wasn't just my doing. Well, we organized the American Schizophrenia Association many years ago, and we were able to enlist the interest of a bunch of very good American psychiatrists, Dr. Ted Roby from New Jersey, Alan Cott from New York, a whole bunch of very brilliant psychiatrists. And it was wide open at that time, and so since I was director of research, I had lots of time. I made myself everything. I was chairman, I was this, I was that. And we would meet twice a year as a committee on of research of the American Schizophrenia Association. And we'd wide open, uh, Alan Cott would say, hey guys, I had a patient that wasn't doing any, wasn't talking, he was mute. And he says, I put him on vitamin B6 and that was an amazing change. So we'd all say, hey, isn't that amazing? Instead of saying, oh, you're, forget that nonsense, you can't do that, you know. We said, well, isn't that interesting? So at the next meeting, we would, someone else would come along. I tried out what Koch said, and hey, guys, it works. We had these informal meetings, and this was a fantastic amount of information. And that's where we brought Linus Pauling in. I remember we had our meeting in Vancouver at the home of Dr. Ross McLean. And there I am, chairman of the meeting, and as a chairman, you're not supposed to do anything. You know, you're supposed to just sit there and be quiet and make sure things are running properly. So I'm listening to all my colleagues, there are 10 of us, reading their fantastic papers. They're talking about folic acid, they're talking about B6, talking about zinc, Carl Pfeiffer, everyone. They're all giving us some amazing information. So I said to myself, this is fantastic. Here is this very important information. No one hears about it. We have to publish it. So David Hawkins is sitting on my right, and he's a good friend of mine. And I said, David, I said to the group, we have to publish a book. So they stop, and since I'm the chairman, they have to listen to me. That's the power of the chair. And I said, David, you are going to be the editor. And he gulped. He said, what? I said, don't worry, we'll help you. Each one of us will submit a chapter. So eventually David said, yeah, okay. He thought he would do it. So after a while, we were starting to organize this book. So then it occurred to one of us, I don't know who it was, it might have been David, that maybe we could ask Linus Pauling to become an editor I'm talking about the book of Orton Lecker of Psychiatry. Mm -hmm. So David, no, no, I think David wrote to Pauling and asked him. Pauling said, yes, he would, on one condition. And the condition was that he would have to approve of every paper that appeared in that. So we, of course, said, fantastic. And that's how that book came out. Because we had that spirit of cooperation. Mm -hmm. We were able to examine new ideas so quickly. We didn't have to wait for these terribly slow university-sponsored, you know, these. if you have an idea today in Sakai, you forget it. By the time you're ready to go for it two years later, you'll have lost interest in it. Mm -hmm. We didn't have those handicaps in those days towards doing research because we knew the basic rule of medicine, first do no harm. And you cannot harm your patients by giving them vitamins. It was fantastic. So now you've talked about an epic chapter that I think propelled this whole model that you birthed forward, and that was the 1968 publication in Science Magazine authored by Pauling of the article Orthomolecular Psychiatry. It right. seemed to put the discipline up on the big board. Did that change the visibility for you of what you'd been doing? Yes, it did. It gave it prestige. It also gave us a lot of work. But I remember what happened, because I had not met Linus Pauling before then, but one day, apparently, he had been getting letters from a large number of Americans who had heard about the vitamin approach and were putting themselves on it and were getting some response. So he was getting more interested. And it fitted in with his own basic concept of molecular medicine. I think this had been gestating in his mind for some time. 
So one day I get a letter from Linus Pauling, dear Dr. Harford, and he said, I am enclosing a manuscript which I propose to send to science. Would you please go over to make sure that you are properly quoted? Now, isn't that amazing? Fantastic. Can you think of any other uh, scientist that would do that? Yes. He was so honest. Mm-hmm. And so I read it, and he was, of course, Linus Pauling never made any mistakes. And so I read it carefully. He quoted us. He was very fair and very honest with what he wrote about this. I wrote back and said, it's absolutely great. It's great. So then he came along with the word. Now, at that time, we had been playing with the word megavitamin therapy, which I didn't really like that much because there's no such thing as a megavitamin. It just doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. And when he published his paper, I said, that's the answer. This term, Atlantis Pauling's, covers almost everything that we are going to do. Since then, I haven't thought of anything better than the term orthomolecular. But even amongst my colleagues, they became very upset because they were getting used to the term megavitamin therapy. Mm-hmm. And we had our own, you know, we had our own conservatives as well as liberals in our own group. And so I took on a major role. I said, I am going to defend the word orthomolecular until it kills me. It's going to become the word. And since, again, I was chairman and I had some prestige, I was able to gradually force the word in. And even with the Journal of Orthomolecular Medicine, for many years, people wanted me to change the word because orthomolecular is very unpopular. I said, so what? Of course, it's unpopular, but we're going to change that. And thank God, Jeff, yes. we are actually changing. The word is becoming well-known, popular in Europe, in Brazil, many other places. And recently, in the past few weeks, we've had people here from Portugal, people here from all over the place who are, in fact, so determined to go back home and start up with this word. Now, it's a temporary word. It's a temporary word, I think, because one day when all of medicine is orthomolecular, we won't need the term. We'll drop the term orthomolecular and we'll say this is what modern medicine is, and anyone who doesn't practice it will be subject to malpractice suits. So you mentioned this book, and it strikes for me such an important chapter in my life because as a young assistant professor, in 1970, I was searching for models and mentors outside my own department and trying to carve out my identity as a young, new, emerging academic researcher. And I happened on to that book in, I think it was probably 71 or 72, in that early 1970s period. And it just was like finding the Rosetta Stone for me. When I opened that book, it was so powerful. Each chapter was like a treasure. You had assembled such a remarkable group of authors and thinkers. Yeah, but uh, but don't forget, we also had the master read each paper, mm-hmm. and he was so kind. I remember in one of the paper I sent him a manuscript. I like to write content. I think a paper, its content is important. I'm a bit more sloppy when it comes to punctuation and style. I just don't have enough energy to do that. And Linus, so one, in one of my papers, I think I left out a comma. And Linus is too polite to tell me that you had forgotten to put that comma in. So he sent me a letter. He said, Dear Abram, he said, I think your secretary forgot to put a comma in in this particular spot. Oh, that's wonderful. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? That's, that's so Dr. Pauling. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the two of you share something very common that I think great people have, and that's Humility and grace. Well, he had that. He I had think that. You, you both have that. It's a very but he, but he, would, he also had. He was like a racehorse that never lost a race. Mm-hmm. And I knew that when Linus joined us, I said to our friend, "The battle's over. <laughs> it's, we won." Now, it may not know it. The world may not know it for a long time, but we knew we had won the battle because his theories, even today, are so sound. Yes. I'm sure you know. And the sad thing is that if the drug companies had accepted his view, they wouldn't have wasted billions and billions of dollars finding toxic drugs that do more harm than good. Mm-hmm. It's been a terrible waste. The drug industry has been a terrible waste. I was proud to be a psychiatrist, very proud. I started as a standard psychiatrist. I got my specialty in psychiatry. I became well-known in that field. I was one of the five top directors of psychiatric research in the United States and Canada. We were the first to bring Haldol in. I remember I was one of that first study group to do Haldol. I knew drugs. I knew drugs. I was an MD. And I was proud of it. And now, guess what? Now I have turned against it. I now have concluded, and since I no longer am practicing as a doctor, I can talk freely, 
because they can't take away my license so that I don't practice anymore. If every psychiatrist were to go to Mars, they would be worse off and we would be better off. Mm-hmm. That's my opinion. Mm-hmm. So when we look at the development of this whole wonderful, rich model, the concept that Dr. Pauling proposed in that paper in Ortho Psychiatry and Science Magazine was a concept that was fairly sophisticated for the average doctor. Because it Absolutely. It talked about mass action and kinetic rate constants, and it talked about enzyme binding to right. coenzymes, and these are things that the average doc probably doesn't think yeah. that much about. But some now 30 years later, Dr. Bruce Ames at Berkeley I know. comes back with this marvelous paper that says, guys, relook at this. This is all right. That's right. And he now, he, in his last paper, he maintains that almost most of the, most of the conditions, in fact, are a result of some metabolic fault of this type. Now, Harry Foster and I wrote that book, mm-hmm. and I stole Linus Pauling's title. I hope he forgives me for a bit of plagiarism, <laughs> but I thought it was such a nice title, I would honor him by using it. And in this book, we maintain, as a result of very careful studies, that half the population of North America would benefit by taking B3, either niacin or niacinamide. It is a very, very important nutrient. They're all important, but this is one that particularly important because Linus Pauling suggested that we lost the ability to convert sugar into vitamin C, what is it, 25 or 50 billion years ago, that this was advantageous as long as our diet contained enough vitamin C. I think the same thing is happening with B3 and tryptophan. And there was a major change in 1800. The first description clinically of schizophrenia was around 1800. And before then it was rare. And around 1800 it was a major change in that Miller's learned how to make white flour. On my PhD I was a flour chemist. I did analysis on flour. So they learned how to make white flour, which had lost all its B vitamins. And I think it was after that that we gradually began to see an increase and the incidence of schizophrenia. And it keeps on going up. David Horobin, a good friend of mine, mm-hmm. in his book, Adam and Eve or something, mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. he maintains that the genes for schizophrenia, I think there's more than one, I think there's a whole bunch of them, these are gradually sweeping into the population. And my prediction is that if we all are still here a million years from today, we will all have the genes and no one will be sick. Because if we were intelligent enough, we will make sure that every human gets the right quantities of B vitamins, and not just niacin, all the B vitamins. And my prediction is that almost half of all the human illnesses will vanish. will vanish within 10 years. So this sounds yeah. very consistent also with Dr. Roger Williams' concept of genetotropic disease. Absolutely. And you were all birthed in the same period of time. You, Dr. Pauling, and Dr. Williams yeah. in the 40s and coming into the 50s was when this concept really emerged. Yeah. Well, I knew Roger Williams. He was a great guy. Unfortunately, he was deaf and blind almost at the end of his life, but he was a great guy. I loved his work. In fact, I refer to his concept frequently. I have a friend who was the world's greatest pianist, Anton Querty. He's a Canadian beautiful pianist. And you remember that Roger Williams made the comparison of an orchestra. Mm-hmm. In other words, each member of the orchestra plays a vital role. Otherwise, you don't have a symphony. If you don't have everyone playing from the same book with the same conductor and the same music, you have a cacophony, you don't have a symphony. So I tell the story, which is true. In Boston a few months ago, Anton Querty, who was the world's greatest pianist, he was at a concert where his son was the conductor. And that evening they were having a show, and the pianist who was supposed to perform couldn't make it. So without any notice, he called upon his dad to come forward and play, and they had a fantastic concert. So this was reported in The Economist. So I thought that was absolutely great. So the story is, I talk about this, and I say that, according to Linus Pauling, no nutrient can be substituted by any xenobiotic. If you need niacin, no drug is going to replace it. You have to give back. So I say it's like, suppose in a concert... The first violinist dies or faints or something, and the conductor decides the show must go on, so he invites the drummer to play in his place. He ain't going to have anything. You're not going to have a symphony. <laughs> and I say, unfortunately, every nutrient is like Anton Querty. Every nutrient has to play its own role, and you cannot replace it. 
And that's my major complaint about the drug industry. They are trying hard because they can't patent vitamins. They're trying hard to find a drug that will replace niacin. My friends and I discovered it lowered cholesterol levels in 1954. You can't patent niacin. If I could have taken a patent on it, I'd be a billionaire today. Because drug companies have spent billions trying to find a compound that has the same good beneficial properties of niacin without any of the terrible side effects that the statins have. It's not available. So Roger Williams, it's the combination of Roger Williams and Linus Pauling that I think were two of the main contributors to this whole field. And I've depended upon them really hugely. So what you're teaching all of us as we're hearing your story is that all great new paradigms start with observation. And absolutely so being a good observer then and being not afraid of your observation and saying, this is something really remarkable that I need to follow up on, not just discounting it as an aberration. And Jeff, you're totally right. I absolutely agree with you. The only honest scientists are good observers, observers and thinkers. The double blind don't tell you anything. Double blinds are a fraud. I think they should be totally made illegal. They shouldn't permit them at all. You have to have good, honest, I should have said honest, you have to have good, honest, who don't have any conflict of interest with the drug companies. Because once you are working for a drug company, honesty flies out the window. Now, that's harsh, but I'm absolutely convinced it's true. And so does the literature. So let's start back at the turn of the last century for a moment, because I'd like to trace the impact of your intellectual development on medicine from talking first about Archibald Gerard, Sir Archibald Gerard, who yeah. was credited as the founding person for the field of genetic metabolism diseases of infancy. Great work. Fantastic work. So that then was kind of leading people to the belief that we had these inborn errors of metabolism that created Wilson's, Gaucher's, Fabre's, this whole constellation, methylmalonic acidurias and Hartnup's disease and so forth. And then along comes Abram Hoffer and Humphrey Osman and for the first time, a model of biological psychiatry is born, which takes these constructs that there are these molecular processes going on in the body that have genetic yeah. relationships that are one size not fitting all, that there is That's a right. differentiation. That's right. And what you birthed, it seems to me, is the biological psychiatric revolution from the observations you made. But then it appears to me, and this is my question, that biological psychiatry, as you birthed it, got perverted into becoming a new form of pharmacology with new to nature molecules. That's right. So how did that happen? How did a good idea get transmuted into becoming? Well, the idea that Charles Garrett developed was a fantastic idea. And the early pioneers in the use of vitamins were of that type. In fact, almost all the papers dealing with vitamins published until 1950 were positive. It's an amazing the amount of literature that describes the many virtues of these vitamins. But they were tied down to what I call the vitamins as prevention paradigm, which meant that you only needed vitamins for a very few classical deficiency diseases like scurvy and pellagra and so on. And they couldn't break this concept into saying, to, well, Maybe we should try higher dosages. The early pioneers, the early pelagrologists who did such great classical work in the United States, they were using all sorts of doses of vitamins and trying getting good results. So this was the beginning of breaking down the concept of the old paradigm. And I've known some of my friends who lost their license to practice because they gave their patients vitamin C. It sounds unbelievable. It's laughable. It has happened. It has happened. So we try to move into the new paradigm which says look upon vitamins as treatment potential. Look upon them the way you would a drug. If a patient has a severe type of pneumonia, you're not going to give him 10,000 units of penicillin a day when he needs 10 million. And so what's happening today in the literature is that all these negative papers, if you read them carefully, they'll make a claim that nobody ever made before. They'll claim, oh, vitamin E prevents heart disease. Well, whoever claimed that? I don't know of any massive claims that have said that. What they have said is that if you do have heart disease, you can get a lot of help by taking enough vitamin E. So having made a spurious claim, they then go ahead and do a study, 
giving their patients 50 units of vitamin E a day. And then they spend millions on this stupid study. And then they come up with the right conclusion. Oh, we were right. It doesn't help. And this is what's been happening in the whole field of nutrition. The whole nutritional literature is unbelievable. There's a very famous Greek professor of philosophy and mathematics. And he's very blunt, like I am. And he says, 80% of the stuff published in medical journals is wrong. 80% of the stuff in medical journals is wrong. I think he's underestimating it. I think the most interesting parts of today's medical journals are the ads, because they're beautiful pictures and they're well-written and they're full of lies, you know. The medical ads are superb for fooling the public. The content, not that interesting, because it's written by the drug companies mostly. So we've talked now about extraordinary successes and contributions and things you're very proud of. Are there things that you look back and you say, these are things I wish it would have gone differently? I wish they wouldn't believe me. <laughs> the main thing is I wondered, about why didn't they believe me? Why didn't they? So why do you think they didn't? Oh, I know now why. It's because it takes education. You had just gone through a very exciting, interesting election campaign in the United States. Do you have a president-elect for the first time who is black? He spent $600 million, at least, on the campaign. He apparently had one of the most promising campaigns ever run in the United States. And all he had to do was to persuade a few people that they could elect him if he was black. Now, if it takes that much money to change attitude, you can imagine how much money it's going to take to change the medical attitude who are already firmly convinced they have the answers. The answer the medical profession has are more drugs, more drugs. They're still looking for the holy grail that they will never, ever find. That's the answer. And the only way we can deal with that is to do what you're doing. Education. Education and education. We have to demand more and more. Teach the doctors. If you can teach 30,000 doctors, and if 10% of them are convinced... You've made a major contribution, and it's happening. So that's a very optimistic note. Now, with your very senior perspective and seeing how things travel through time and space and evolution in the profession, what's your view of medicine as we look forward to the future? I don't complain about all the medicine. I think surgery is superb. If I were in a car accident, I would want to go to a modern surgeon. They do a beautiful job. I think that neurology is just about the same as psychiatry. The worst branches of medicine are neurology, internal medicine, pediatrics, and some of the other. I think that the surgeons are the ones who are really the tops in the field. Maybe that's because they get paid the most, I don't know. I'm hopeful that this will change, but also we have to widen the people who are allowed to treat. We have to bring in the naturopaths. We have to bring in all sorts of therapists. We have to allow psychologists to practice orthomolecular. And also we have to give patients freedom. We don't have enough freedom, you in the States and we in Canada, we don't have enough freedom to select our doctors. Take for example in Canada, I had a young schizophrenic male who was both on drugs, which he got free from the government, and he was on niacin that he'd have to buy himself. And he was doing well, really coming along. And then he came to me and he said, Dr. Hoffer, he said, I can't afford to buy the niacin. It was five dollars a month. Can't afford it. He smoked. I said, Why don't you quit smoking? You know, I couldn't quit smoking. <laughs> he can afford that. Mm -hmm. Because the government wouldn't pay for the five dollars a month, he had to start taking the niacin and he remained sick forever. Now, that's what's happening to our reason. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I believe that what you're speaking to is more than a medical paradigm. It's a thought process as to how we as individuals take responsibility, understand something about our bodies, and then that's elect right. to do something as advocates for our own health and taking charge of that. And medicine is there to help educate and support patients, but yeah. in the end... There has to be some responsibility, doesn't there, in the patient taking charge? Yeah, I absolutely convinced of that. I think that the Americans made a major mistake when they changed the FDA Act under Jack Kennedy. You may remember before that, the FDA only policy was to check on the toxicity. Right. If they could prove that the drug was non-toxic, they said, that's your problem hereafter. I think that wasn't a bad policy. 
But when they gave the FDA the role, a ruling on the efficacy of drugs, it developed an enormous problem. Imagine yourself, you're the head of the FDA and a drug company comes along and says, we have this application and they'll send you a box car full of data that you have to go over. And you have to decide, shall I release it or not? And if you release it, and three years later it turns out you've killed 100,000 people, mm-hmm. you're not going to be very happy about that. So they developed a system which took away all guilt. They began to use the double-blind control study as the arbiter of whether anything is good or not. And if the double-blind p-value hit 0.05, okay, it wasn't our fault. That's what the p-value said. There's a drug that's now used and is very common for Alzheimer's. And I understand that the company that produced that, the first 11 or 12 studies they submitted to the FDA were all negative. The 13th or 14th were positive. And according to FDA rules, if you get one positive out of 10, they'll still approve it. Mm -hmm. So here we have this drug, which I know well, doesn't do anything except make the drug companies rich. We have too much of that. I don't know how we can do that. We have to change the patent system. If we had allowed vitamins to be patented, different situation. So we're at a very interesting juncture, I think, in human history. There are these epic points in human history, inflection points. We've kind of assumed that cultural history grows linearly, but it doesn't. It grows in fits and starts, and we're in one of those really interesting exponential change periods. So as we see this change occur, the leverage of wisdom that comes from the past will become very important for determining our future. If a doctor was starting out today and you were to to meet with them, what guidance would you give them in how to... Before I would accept them into medicine, I would want them to take a course on the history of medicine. The history of medicine is a history of conflict. Most doctors don't know that. For example, anesthesia was opposed because the male doctors knew that women had to suffer pain. God said that when you have to have a baby, you have to suffer pain. So therefore, you could not use it to relieve suffering except for Queen Victoria, who thought she was probably God in her own right. So she accepted ether. And that broke the logjam. Once she used ether for having one of her babies, pretty soon doctors were clamoring to claim they had discovered it first. She broke the logjam. Did you know that the stethoscope was opposed for a long time? You knew about that. Mm -hmm. And the reason was that it was indecent to listen to a female chest. You're not allowed to put your ear up against a female chest. Why not? Male doctors weren't allowed to do that. So they used rolled up paper and then they started the stethoscope and that took a long time to bring in. So the history of medicine tells us that it takes anywhere between 40 and 60 years for a new paradigm to get established. So I'd want them all to take a course in the history of medicine, a really good course in the history of medicine. I would want them to take a course in the doctor-patient relationship how important it is that you be a human dealing with a human of equal value. You are not talking down to a servant or to a slave. In the medical profession, they think they are gods, and sitting in front of them are their poor slaves who say, Doc, I have a headache. Great. Take this pill. Out you go. Don't bother me anymore. And we want to change that. I would insist they take courses in sexuality, which they don't do now. Most doctors know nothing about sex except their own experiences. So we'd have to prepare them by actually spending a year or two in preparation for what they would take as medicine. And then I would like to see two streams into medicine. Medicine, after all, is a technology. It's not a science. It's a technology. And we need it. We need superb technologists. That's why the surgeons are so great. Surgeons aren't scientists, but they're excellent technologists. They know exactly what to do, and how fast to do it. They know what to do. So we need to have two streams. One stream goes into a technical school which gives you an MD, but you don't do any basic research, or if you do, you switch. Then we'd have the second one where you'd go on to a university to take a PhD in medicine, which would then teach you the elements of honest research and train you to look into new ideas whenever they develop. We have to completely change the whole system of medicine. We have to take away from the drug companies any influence they have. We have to prevent them from giving any money to the universities. That's going to be a problem. We have to enforce governments to become more responsible and to take over the burden that they really should be carrying because they'll save so much money they do it properly. 
So these are the things I think we'd have to do. We have to reorganize the whole system of medical education. Mm -hmm. Won't happen in my time. It's fascinating. In the United States now, um, less than 10% of the incoming students are interested in doing any what is traditionally called family practice. They're all being pulled into specialty medicine because that's where the money is to be made. And, that's right. And so we're losing a lot of the things that you're talking about, the skill of listening to patients, the skill of, of being there present to understand a patient's complex ideology of their condition. And yeah. some of the things that are the most profound in medicine, you're saying, are the simplest things if they're properly applied. That's right. That's right. You know, I, I, can, I, I can't stop talking about things I've seen. I remember one patient who I had to admit to the hospital. She was on five or six or 12 different medications. All they said, hey, nothing. Withdraw everything. Take her off everything. A week later, they're feeling great. I had a woman come here with a printout list of 28 drugs she was taking. She's 75. She's on 28 different drugs. And she says to me, seriously, Dr. Harper, she says, I have to take every one of them. Puts me in a terrible position. I'm, she's already taking 28 compounds. Am I going to add three or four more <laughs> to this big list? We are over-medicating. We are killing. Take it from me, Jeff. This is a prediction. We are heading for a major catastrophe. Imagine all the hundreds of thousands of schizophrenic patients who have been on drugs 10, 15, 20 years it's the same as the HIV virus. They've been on these retroviral drugs. Everyone claims, isn't that fantastic? They don't die. Well, they don't die as fast. Many wish they would. They're not healthy. They're very, very sick people. They cannot perform. They're mostly sick. They have to take huge amounts of drugs. They get all sorts of illnesses like tuberculosis, lesions, cancers, everything. We are heading to a very sick century. If China really wants to beat the Americans... They should forbid any Chinese from taking any American drugs. And they'll remain as healthy or sick as they are now, which Linus Pauling called a moderate state of ill health. And the Americans and Canadians will go downhill, down, down, down. We're going to run out of people who can work because there'll be too many sick. Our major industry is going to be nursing doctors. We are creating a society where we need more doctors, more doctors, more nurses, more caretakers, more, more this, more that. And so we will spend all of our industry, all our money, just simply looking after ourselves. Who's going to build our highways? Who's going to make our equipment? Maybe that's why we're sending everything offshore, because we don't have enough people left behind to do these things. Yeah, I think we are good. creating a very sick society. Well, I hope that you were as moved as I was to hear Dr. Hoffer, and also to put it in the context of a 20-year previous interview with Dr. Linus Pauling. I mean, just to have those voices resonating in our ears and influencing our nervous system and patterning our thinking is like putting a, a virus of hope and goodness <laughs> into our system of learning. What an amazing two contributors they are to the paradigm of what we've been talking about. You know, I reminded myself as I've heard them and listened to these interviews that I was very fortunate also to interview Dr. Roger Williams. And I think it's really fascinating to think through how these three individuals who were all living at the same time gave birth to not only an industry, but to a field of medicine that will gain traction as we move into the 21st century further and becomes a systems biology functional approach towards healthcare. So really epic landmark discussions. Let me, if I can, say a few things in about Dr. Hoffer's contributions for those of you who might want a little additional information. Dr. Hoffer has two sons, one who is a research professor of medicine at McGill University at the Lady Davis Institute for Medical Research in the Jewish General Hospital in Montreal, Quebec, Canada. He's also an MD, PhD. This is Leonard John Hoffer. And I was very intrigued to learn, showing coincidence in life, that Dr. John Hoffer was a doctoral student at the same time that our own Dr. Bob Learman was getting his Ph.D. in nutrition at MIT, and so they shared the same department and the same research professor as medical doctors going through their Ph.D. programs in nutrition. Dr. Learman is one of our chief investigators and clinical directors in our functional medicine clinical research center. 
So it's showing the consanguity of knowledge and interaction and how ideas spread from individuals who share intellectual domains and sometimes even physical domains and how these contacts can create spreading effects in terms of the stickiness of new ideas. So Dr. Hoffer, who obviously grew up in the environment with his father, and you can only imagine what was talked around around the dinner table, ultimately moved on to become a psychiatrist on his own and also a Ph.D. in sciences and has been studying many, many things from a basic and clinical science perspective, one of which is to revisit this vitamin therapy and schizophrenia discoveries that his father had made. And in a recent review paper that he authored in the Journal of Psychiatry and Related Sciences, this is volume 45, page 3 in 2008, he talks about the fact that it is dismaying that well into the 21st century, schizophrenia remains a highly prevalent, devastating, and poorly understood disease for which the only accepted therapy is nonspecific antipsychotic and anti-seizure medications. He goes on to say that fresh approaches, even unconventional ones, should be welcomed for study by the psychiatric community if they are biologically plausible and non-toxic. And in a review article, this article in 2008, he summarizes the evidence that certain vitamin insufficiencies can worsen the symptoms of schizophrenia, and the evidence at large doses of certain vitamins could improve the core metabolic abnormalities that predispose some people to develop it. It recounts the history in this article of the controversial vitamin-based therapy that his father and Humphrey Osmond discovered for schizophrenia called orthomolecular psychiatry and the collaborative work with Dr. Linus Pauling that you heard Dr. Abram Hoffer talk about in his interview. And it ultimately concludes in this review article advocating a process for discovering promising new schizophrenia therapies that involve small, carefully conducted clinical trials of nutrient combinations in appropriately selected patients. So this is, again, a part of the evolving frontier of this paradigm that we've been describing to look at nutrient insufficiencies from an orthomolecular genetotrophic disease perspective and to modulate them in the individual needs, personalized nutrition or personalized medicine in this case, to improve their function. As you know, it's currently popular to regard schizophrenia as a multiple-hit neurodevelopmental disorder, but equally plausible is the older hypothesis of a toxic psychosis triggered by an abnormal endogenous metabolite. Organic brain disorders, including indistinguishable forms of schizophrenia, may be induced by certain drugs and by neurological, metabolic, and inflammatory and infectious diseases. Such disorders account for approximately 5% of cases initially diagnosed as first episode schizophrenia by expert psychiatrists. So we start thinking that maybe not all forms of schizophrenia come from nutrient insufficiencies because it's a heterogeneous diagnosis. But if we could pick out those that are responsive to nutrient insufficiencies, we might be able to get very marked clinical improvement in some percentage. Who knows if that percentage is 5, 10, or 20 percent or whatever it might be based upon a more personalized approach that's dependent upon proper assessment. So this has to go back to proper biochemical assessment, asking the right questions to get the right answers. You don't ask the right questions, you never get the answers. So what kind of assessment do we do for looking at general nutritional status and biochemical individual needs and this whole genetotrophic origin in the soil that Archibald Garad talked about at the turn of the 19th to the 20th century. So with that in mind, it leads us into this concept that, as Dr. Abram Hoffer pointed out, the signs of schizophrenia look very similar in presentation to part of the triad of presenting symptoms of pellagra dermatitis, diarrhea, and dementia. And these dementia-like effects or affects resemble very closely some of the things that are associated with schizophreniform presentations. So as we get into this whole metabolite question and we start looking at genetic metabolism diseases associated with nutrient need, like systemia or pellagris dementia or things that are related to beriberi or things that are related to issues of various megaloblastic anemias, we see that they all have these schizophreniform affects that are presented in the individuals, suggesting metabolite toxicity, to use a term loosely, that has been seen as a consequence of insufficiency of specific nutrients needed by the genetic uniqueness of that individual. So we not only have niacin, vitamin B3, but pyridoxine, B6, and evidence on folic acid and evidence on ascorbic acid 
there's good data on all of these having influences on metabolic function in genetically unique individuals that can lower the load of secondary toxic metabolites. So I think that we're starting to witness maybe a revisiting of this now 50-year-old model that was presented by Dr. Hoffer, and he talked about it in his interview. And I find it very, very interesting because if you look at Dr. Hoffer's original papers, what you will find that these papers that appeared in The Lancet really discuss this metabolite hypothesis in a very, very, what I would consider precise way, given the knowledge we had about physiological chemistry in the middle 20th century. So we've kind of dismissed these out of hand for reasons that are not easily understandable. And we've from that then just said, well, we need to find drugs to block the function or to arrest a certain outcome and to treat a symptom without looking deeper at where the cause of these conditions that we call schizophrenia might originate. I think this paper that appeared in The Lancet in the same period of time, in the early 50s and 1960s, this actually was entitled Massive Niacin Treatment in Schizophrenia, Review of a Nine-Year Study. This is Abram Hoffer and Humphrey Osman in The Lancet, February 10th, 1962, on page 316, is a classic. And they go on to say that, as Dr. Hoffer in his interview pointed out, their interest in niacin began at the end of 1951 when exploring ideas developed with Dr. John Smithies. By the way, that's the same John Smithies that you probably know is credited to having made the observation that neural tube defects are found in babies born by mothers who are suffering from folic acid insufficiency. And it took some 50 years from the discovery of Smithies of this association between B vitamin deficiencies and anencephaly and neural tube defects, the most common birth defects before that was generally accepted. So in these discussions among uh, Humphrey Osmond, Abram Hoffer, and John Smithies was born this niacin concept. And then he goes on to say, we thought that schizophrenia might be caused by a disorder of adrenaline metabolism in which the body produced a substance with metabolic toxicity that induced psychological effects that were similar to that of, say, some of the psychotropic drugs like mescaline or D-lysergic acid diamid, LSD. These ideas have since been called the adrenaline or adrenochrome metabolite theory of schizophrenia, and it's a special example of that particular theory. So I think that these conceptual frameworks, which maybe were dismissed early on when they were first presented and published, are now being revisited in the age of metabolic medicine and the age of network and systems biology. Now that takes us into a further reflection on Dr. Pauling's work, because what we really said is that maybe there's something here about general function that is related to immune defense and related to cell repair and related to cell replication that has to do with individual nutritional status and has its roots in this concept of orthomolecular medicine. I found a very interesting example of this that appeared in the journal Neurology in 2008, volume 71, page 1856, in which the investigators, this is a group from the VA Medical Center in uh, Oklahoma City reported that intervening post-stroke in patients with intensive nutritional supplement program improved significantly their outcomes. And they went on to say that intensive nutritional supplementation using readily available commercial preparations was found to improve motor recovery in previously undernourished patients receiving intensive inpatient rehabilitation after stroke. And therefore, again, a induced effect, in this case, a stroke event, may enhance the level of need of specific nutrients for improving outcome in a a post-stroke situation. So again, it's a whole series of variables. Uh, Genetic uniqueness coupled with environmental factors give rise to the individual need for specific nutrients. And one size doesn't fit all, and it's not just on the back of a cereal box that you learn about what the level of nutrients are for optimal function of that individual. So I think that's a very, very interesting conceptual framework as it pertains to this whole emerging theme that Dr. both Pauling and Dr. Hoffer talked about. Going back to revisit the uh, vitamin C and cancer story that was first described by Dr. Pauling. Actually, this was a fully engaged discussion when I was at the Pauling Institute as a research scientist back in the early 1980s, actually at the time that I interviewed Dr. Pauling. And as you probably know, there was a very strong criticism of his concepts of vitamin C in cancer, the Ewan Cameron Linus Pauling concept. And in fact, 
Dr. Mortel, who is one of the principals in oncology at Mayo Clinic, made a very big story about debunking, supposedly, the vitamin C cancer connection. But yet, now we come to the more recent period of the 21st century, and we see this magnificent bit of work and paper that's been authored by Dr. Balls Fry and Steve Lawson from the Linus Pauling Institute at Oregon State University. This appeared in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, August 12th of 2008, on page 11037. And in this particular paper, they talk about vitamin C and cancer being revisited in light of the more recent work that's been published on uh, vitamin C and cancer by Chen et al., entitled Pharmacological Doses of Ascorbate Act as a Prooxidant and Decreased Growth of Aggressive Tumor Xenografts in Animals. This was another Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences paper in Volume 105 in 2008. And you probably also know that there's some extraordinary work that's been done at the NIH looking at the graded doses of vitamin C in humans as it pertains to individual needs, showing the diversity of need using in situ kinetics. This is Mark Levine's work, endocrinologist at NIH, who has found that the level of need of vitamin C is far greater than we thought from person to person. And then we get into therapeutic doses of vitamin C where we're actually using vitamin C intravenously as a potential selective prooxidant to induce in cells that have been transformed that have poor antioxidant defense mechanism, selective alteration in their reactive oxygen species production, causing internal cell suicide to occur in apoptosis of those cells. And so what we're starting to see is that millimolar concentrations of extracellular vitamin C kill cancer cells in these xenograft animals, but not normal cells. Once again, reopening what Dr. Pauling had talked about with Dr. Cameron back in the 1970s and 1980s. Again, new methods of understanding of the role that particular augmented levels of certain nutrients, in this case vitamin C, might have as therapeutic agents, safe, non-toxic therapeutic agents. So I think the story is not over. It's continuing to be revisited. And what Dr. Pauling talked about in this interview in 1982 is still emerging to be seen today. In fact, in a very nice paper that was authored by Dr. Leonard John Hoffer and Dr. Mark Levine, this was a phase one clinical trial of IV ascorbic acid and advanced malignancy. It's a human intervention trial that was published in the Annals of Oncology, volume 19, page 1969 in 2008. This group of investigators reported that high doses of intravenous vitamin C was well tolerated they were unable to demonstrate in this phase one study uh, anti-cancer activity when administered to patients with previously treated advanced malignancies. However, what they say is that there might be benefit in synergistic administration of vitamin C intravenously with other cytotoxic or redox active molecules to enhance the cytotoxicity in a selective way. So work is still ongoing, right? We're still learning more about the story. We're still learning the difference between nutritional needs of the individual as determined by their genetics and therapeutic nutrition, what we call nutritional pharmacology, enhanced levels of specific nutrients beyond that that you would use for normal maintenance for therapeutic application in disease states or environmentally altered physiology. We still have a lot of confusion in the epidemiological literature about how important are some of these antioxidant vitamins in helping to protect function and enhance health over the long term and reduce the risk of disease. We have papers like that that appeared in the Journal of the American Medical Association in 2008. This is in volume 300, page 2123, entitled Vitamin E and C in the Prevention of Cardiovascular Disease in Men. And in this large long-term trial of male physicians, it was reported that neither vitamin E or C supplementation reduced the risk of major cardiovascular events and the data provide no support for the use of these supplements for the prevention of cardiovascular disease. However, again, we have to ask the question, is there data lost in the mass? Should we be stratifying the data? Should we be looking at those cohorts that are most genetically unique and susceptible? Should we be screening for biomarkers that are more likely to be responsive so that we don't lose them in the mass of the non-responders because we didn't tease out those that are most uniquely at risk? The same thing can hold true for sodium restriction and hypertensions or cholesterol dietary restrictions and hypercholesterolemia. There are a myriad of examples of individuals who have specifically higher risk to certain things as a consequence of their environmental choices versus the body politic. One can even use gluten as an example where you'd say, well, 
not everybody has gluten sensitivity, but those individuals that do have gluten intolerance, the food which may be good for one becomes a poison for another, and therefore they may be lost in the mass of a large study, but they're very real for those people who end up with celiac sprue and who may be statistically an aberration in a large study, but for them eating wheat is very dangerous. By the same token, we might say that it could be uh, applied to things like these roles that various vitamin supplements and nutrient supplements have on modulation of relative risk in individuals with unique susceptibility. Their data points get lost in the mass of those that are non-responders because not everybody needs the same thing. And we make decisions from the law of averages. However, Dr. Roger Williams, as you know, said something very powerful about this. He said, quote, nutrition is for real people. Statistical humans are of little interest, end quote. Yet as we look at the history of the way we learn about therapeutic applications of various agents, we recognize that we often apply them to 70-kilogram mythical humans, the statistical average. We regress to the mean. Sometimes you can regress to the mean and lose all your value of specificity. I believe in this age of personalization and genomics, what we're going to recognize is that we lost a lot of very important data by just throwing them out as the law of the averages, as losing them in the noise. The same thing might even be true for looking at autism and the relationship of autistic disorders to MMR vaccination. It may be in the gross level of children that there is very low penetrance of the susceptibility to MMR being the etiological trigger for autism. But in individual children of small percentage, this may be a real trigger for immunological activation. And as a consequence for them, they end up with a neurological risk that is lost in the average of means. So what I would really suggest is that we're moving from this massification concept of medicine to a personalization concept of medicine. The individual has primacy. The statistical human is of lower interest. It's very much easier to do statistical studies and to group everybody together and then to do kind of a parametric analysis and think of things as univariant and get your t-tests and your p-values looking at agent x against outcome y and do single vision analysis. That makes it fairly simple. It's much more complicated when you start stratifying and looking at differential effects and individualization and biochemical individuality and orthomolecular and systems biology. That's certainly a more complicated situation. But if we have squeezed out all the value, the low-hanging fruit, so to speak, of the single agent against single outcome, maybe it's time if we're really going to rectangularize the survival curve, per compress morbidity and increase the health span, that we start to look at this new model, this systems biology model, this differential biochemically stratified model, looking at individuality that is really born out of the discoveries of Archibald Garrod and geneticists of the transition of the 19th to the 20th century and moving into the transition of genomics as a paradigm in the 21st century and ultimately leading into systems biology, which is the future of where functional medicine and functional nutrition is going. So I hope that you appreciate that what you have just witnessed in listening to the interviews with Dr. Pauling and Dr. Hoffer is really the birthing of what has taken more than 100 years to evolve and to mature this paradigm shift in thinking, this frame shift in the way we see the origin of disease, this new lens of filtering information through. It's not just an individual therapy that we're talking about. It's a conceptual shift in the framework of how we understand and manage chronic age-related diseases at the individual level, at the patient-specific level, at that moment that we're in the exam room with that patient, at that sentient humanistic level of discourse about how to manifest the appropriate program for them, not the program for the average, but the program for that individual patient as they present with their antecedents, their triggers, exposing them to their mediators, which ultimately then creates their signs and symptoms. This is the functional medicine model. This is what we've been talking about for now more than 20 years. And I believe that it is starting to gain traction, gain an understanding, gain a fundamental science that supports the paradigm. And now the challenge is finding ways to really apply this effectively in the clinic. And I hope what you've learned from the discussions with Dr. Pauling and Dr. Hoffer is that we are on this journey together. It's a step at a time. 
It's an evolving paradigm, but truth is its own vector. It wills out in the end, and there is a fundamental truth to this model that is emerging that will ultimately deliver a more effective patient-centered medicine that results in better patient outcome and ultimately achieves what Dr. Pauling and his wife, Eva Helen, talked about with me years ago when I asked them why the Pauling Institute of Science and Medicine was born. And he said, very simply, it was to find ways to reduce human suffering. And I think this model that we're describing can deliver that outcome in a cost-effective, humanistic way. Thanks so much for listening to this epic version of Functional Medicine Update. I think this will stand timeless when we go back and re-listen in years to come to Dr. Pauling and Dr. Hoffer and their prescient view of the future of medicine. Functional Medicine Update is copyrighted by Synthesis LLC by Dr. Jeffrey Black. Reproduction in any form is prohibited. Thank you.